Clan is always and has always been a collective of individuals uh, making really diverse musical sounds and uh, artistic output. so much uh, driven by this ability to recontextualise history. The main thing that drew me to electronic music is the beauty of the sounds and the fact that there's no limit to what you can create. The yummiest thing about Clan and being a part of Clan is working and dealing and playing with other people. A bunch of guys in a room and a bunch of keyboards staring at things and patching things and I thought, oh my god, what am I doing here? This is bizarre. Literally typing out the invite for the first meeting, which I think had some sort of monstrous kind of uh, modular analog synth as the graphic. And I was typing out the text and saying, come along to our electronic meeting, uh, this analogue clan, uh, clan analogue. One of the, uh, the most important, I suppose, electronic bands in this town, they are Wind Up Toys, very much of the old school. Hi, Owen, thank you very much for having us on your show. Wind Up Toys being very much a part of clan analogue as well. Following rules is not something that, clan acts are famous for anyway and in my opinion shouldn't be famous for going to the album double exposure from wind up toys for me one of the great things about it is that balance of yes it has elements of experimentalism but it's also incredibly accessible it started in london in the end of 50s a lot of the musical styles and genres that that clan members were playing with really became mainstream anyway so it was like mainstream caught up with or uh, with what Clan was doing anyway, or vice versa. I mean, maybe we we started reflecting the the widest sort of trend in music. It started with the same cologne, helmet line, or was it Calvin Klein? Now when we go out alone. Brian Eno makes a good point about um, all pop music has been technology driven um, and he refers to Frank Sinatra. Um, those Frank Sinatra records in the 50s with Nelson Riddle, which are quite glorious, uh, were only made possible by advances in microphone technology. That's electronic music. Uh, look through the 60s, Beatles and all that sort of stuff. It's no big deal. It's never been a big deal to me, the whole idea of doing electronic music. It's just the way to make music. late night out, you know, at about six o'clock in the morning, I met someone called Toby Grime, who uh, lived in the same suburb as me, and uh, 
a few days later, we actually met again on the same train station, and he had a a, um, a, a Casio synthesizer of some description under his arm. But I think it was a CZ101 for um, any Casio keyboard buffs out there that need to know. But um, we just got chatting, and then you know I had some stuff, he had some keyboards, and um, decided to form a group. And so it was about the same time that that was happening, the clan formed. Officially, it's about 92, 93 is kind of when the first tapes and meetings were happening around Sydney. I mean, the initial vision was just getting people together and seeing what they do. It was almost like, a, I mean, the social, you know, sort of social engineering sort of experiment side of things of, you know, okay, well, what are we, what happens if we get together a bunch of sort of fairly random people connected to electronic music? Clan Analog is a very, it's, a, it's been going for years and years and years and it's had, you know, hundreds of people have been involved with it. We're networked with all these people, we, you know, do music with them sometimes, we'll do gigs with people, things like that. There wasn't really an ambition to, you know, form a collective that had, uh, you know, a record label subsidiary and um, splintered off into multiple cities and had hundreds of, you know, electronic artists involved. Originally it was based around an idea about analogue synths, about getting musical styles out there which at the time in the early 90s really weren't very well recognised. Waiting for them to get to her. The main thing that drew me to electronic music is the beauty of the sounds and the fact that there's no limit to what you can create in sound except what's in your imagination. Um, so that really drew me, it just seemed infinitely mysterious and full of potential. And at the time I was messing around with um, you know, a four track recorder and a synthesizer and a drum machine writing backing tracks so I could do epic guitar noodles over the top. I started kind of being intrigued by this idea that I could produce whole arrangements just myself. You're very powerful because you can actually write a whole song. I like where you can you know, write the drum part, you write the bass part. To some extent, it's like using your own uh, acoustic instrument. It certainly gives you the very specific sound which you are uh, focused on, and it's the sound of your music. So, in a way, the tools of your trade are certainly influencing your music, and you're trying to shape them as much as you desire, of course, but sometimes things are completely out of control and you might be taken places which you never expected to be taken to. For example, Bob Moog um, said that the writing electronic music is halfway between um, creating and witnessing. So there's a real sense with some of these machines that you are channeling something through the machine out again. And that's a very um, alluring feeling, a very um, powerful and, and spiritual feeling as well, I find. So for all those reasons, um, I was uh, deeply attracted to it. My sense of what the electronic scene is in Australia has really widened a lot over the last 10 years. I think Australia has got a damn fine, fine selection of excellent electronic musicians. There is no doubt about it. Um, and they, they stand out with others from overseas, obviously, you know, because they get played on charts and that sort of thing. And I feel it's obviously probably the most popular music in the world at the moment, but still, money-wise, I feel Australia is probably one of the weakest markets in the world, and uh, it's still a very small market. Probably 90% of everything that I sell gets sold overseas um, to a European market. It's just, there's a lot more of a history of dance music culture in places like Berlin. I just think there are 
that Australian artists are overlooked somehow or maybe underlooked, I'm not quite sure what, this, what the word would be, um, because we are so far away, you know, Antipode. Back in the you know, mid-90s, exciting as they were, I really just saw electronic music as this sort of stuff, you know, the glorious sort of analogue gear that I would play with and the people who would do the same thing. In the early days, there weren't the genres that you've got now. You've got this about, you know, this hundreds of micro genres, you know, in the world that is electronic stroke techno. Back then it was just like techno and uh, uh, that was kind of good though because you now people were just trying to experiment and come up with ideas that sounded good. And if you look at it today, yeah, there are still people who are doing sort of noodly electronic music, which is great. And then there are people who are doing really experimental sound artwork, which is fantastic. And it's a really vibrant scene, which I think Australia should be proud of. We have an international grade scene of sound art, which is fantastic. And a lot of clan people participated in that and have been active members in that as well. And then you've got all these up and coming kids who are literally just laptop musicians. And they're not just downloading programs and writing fantastic stuff, but coding their own things, using programs like Max to design their own patches and write their own music. So I actually think it's really exciting. It's nowhere near as in the public eye as it has been at various points, say around 99, 2000. But I think that's a good thing. I think it's good for electronic music to be just and the limelight a little where the interesting stuff can happen and there's not too much focus on it, that's when you know it's doing just fine. You've got all your little micro niches and you're, you're a drum and bass person or you're a side trance person. And it wasn't like that in the early days. But I think Clan is still resisting those kinds of, I mean, it's all, it was always a resisting um, collective. It was always resisting the mainstream in terms of the rock and roll aesthetic, resisting the sort of commercial imperatives to just write music that people are just going to you know, you know, consume and dispose of. Um, and it was uh, also resisting the genrefication of techno as well. I mean, people just wanted to make really interesting sounds and have fun and experiment and I think it's still like that. Instead of their weirdness being something that would make the crowd cringe and walk out. It was something that made them special and interesting, you know, and, and it meant that we could get into the, the you know, into the, the artistic side of, of, of life. There seems to be that, that sense of community and that sense of creative exchange. Is that also one of the great things that you guys get out of being involved with Clan Analog? Clan has a structure in place which allows for the collective as a whole to comment on things and the many musicians and artists involved to collectively put their music together and put it out. At the same time, it has to function in a way that is practical as well. It was a group of very friendly people who were there to sort of um, help um, both, uh, I guess, emotionally um, and also uh, help with gear, you know, tips and tracks. And, um, and there was a, there's a real collectivity there about clan, which has been very important and it's still, it's still a major feature of it. lifetime of place to get so excited by just having people to talk to who even listen to the same music as me but more so who could introduce me to heaps of music I'd never heard of. Things like Triple R and things like Clan sort of draw the inspiration out in some way you know and so when you're working with a crew of people which Clan is it's a collective of electronic artists <laughs> um, it's really nice because you're working with other people who have got the same head thoughts in part as you, you know, even if they don't play the same music as you, you still want to do the same things together. And it's really nice, it's really, it's really yummy when people come up to you at a gig and say, oh, I like Clan, Clan does really good things, you know, it's, it's really special. a great stepping stone for many artists. They're getting their first music released, they often getting their first gigs. I mean, it was great for Biff Tech and uh, it's still a good place for people to start and, and get support and encouragement and also to get your tunes out there on compilations and get, a, get some support with marketing and getting gigs and still performing all those functions. I think the fact that Biff Tech was a part of Clan was actually really important 
and a lot of people miss that point um, early on. I think bands that start off and it's just them and a sort of individualistic expression of you know, their art and what they have to say miss out on a certain something that you get from being in a larger group of people. And both Nicole and I had side projects and other bands going at the same time. So I think it was that feeling that, you know, if, if something succeeds, that's great, but it's a many-headed hydra and there are all these different sorts of bands and activities going on which you're involved in. So I think it's less about sort of, you know, oh, band, and more about, yeah, that's great, something's happening here, but these guys are doing well over here and there's all this other stuff going on. So I really like that sense of being part of a much bigger network with many tentacles rather than, you know, just someone having a band fantasy. Clanalog is an interesting organisation because while there, is a, there are a large number of people involved, it quite often relies on the efforts of quite a few to galvanise those efforts into, uh, into action. Over the years, if you look at the history of Clan, it's been individuals who've taken on the mantle for a few years and really triggered a whole lot of events and brought people together. And often that's centred around a particular night. So in Sydney back in the 90s there was a night called Electronic, um, which moved around from places like the Bentley Bar and many other sort of venues around Sydney. And lots of us played gigs at these, you know, these little sort of bar events. And it was a lovely way to bring that community together. And then occasionally you'll go through periods where, like in Sydney, it's very hard to get good venues and it dissipates and it will rise up again. And so you see sort of new faces and old faces coming together around these venues and events. So they've been quite central, I think, in the history of Clan. And I think it becomes difficult, uh, say, for example, in Sydney at the moment, when there isn't a regular venue, people feel more dispersed. Whereas in Melbourne there have been sort of venues cropping up quite regularly for clan events. Basically you've got um, Nick in Melbourne who, who's running the label and because clan is very much label based now and less about the collective, um, it, it makes uh, Melbourne kind of like the headquarters of clan for the moment. But clan's a good crew in Sydney and they get a bit done, you know, putting out the albums and, and that's all. I mean we put out some albums too now which is great but Sydney put out more. Um, so they have, a, and they have a real. I mean, they're the real force, really, behind Clan, as far as I think. The the impression that I get is that there's a lot more um, movement in in like a in Melbourne Clan or places outside Sydney. But Sydney's kind of got this place for you know, it's the original, the old school or something. Well, one of the great nights in in Sydney was Frigid, and that was always open to uh, new um, new sounds and, and things like that that you wouldn't hear anywhere else. So especially stuff like wind-up toys, you know, that, that was a perfect, perfect place for, for wind-up toys. The, the Melbourne crowds um, are less self-conscious and they do, they're obviously there to have a really good time and I, and I think Melbourne's more comfortable with its, with its nightlife. Um, Sydney has a, an outdoor aspect so, you know, uh, it's really hard to get people to reliably turn up. They're very fickle. You know, they might have been had a hard day at the beach, you know, they might be tired. Or, um, and as soon as the weather goes anything other than great, you know, they stay home and watch DVDs, you know. In Sydney, they don't really have meetings much anymore. They tend to just, it's a bit more of an email, sort of online community. In Melbourne, we still do meet, some, some members do meet for monthly for meetings and to plan, plan events. So there's still a little bit more of the of that sort of face-to-face -face grassroots community aspect in Melbourne. With the, the recent dub launch, um, both in Melbourne and in Sydney, there, there seems to be a lot closer link between the two different clans, the clan clan based, because uh, clan started in Sydney. <laughs> different levels and stages of people like this. I think the collectors are fine to kind of just foster and keep that community of that kind of level of you know interest going. There's always going to be the ones that will kind of you know become a bigger entity you know which will be obviously bigger than what the collective can you know manage and you know it can't service you know it can't service those bands. It's not it's not it's not a label design in that way. It's very much a label about just getting new work out to the public. So I think obviously those bands will have to be serviced by other labels. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, just a, it's just the way it is. You do get to the point um, where you need to move on and 
you need to do your own. Stand on your own two feet. Sell for more than you can buy. You, can buy. you know, I, the interesting situation is that it's hard to say who supports who, because I feel that it's actually artists who are who are supporting the clan in a way. It's about three or four years ago when my friend Ian Andrews did a disco stew track and it went really well and it was getting incredible airplay on Triple J. You know, everyone, all the stores wanted this and it just didn't happen. And it was, it was clan's own fault because they didn't own their own stock. I think just, we're just a bit slack about getting things together. I think that for a while clan's been questioning what's um, what, it, what its role is, and that's, that's been made obvious by the step away gradually from face-to-face -face encounters and regular clan events. And most people that are on the forums now are, are still the kind of, uh, you know, the dudes that were doing it years ago who, who, who now have day jobs or um, perhaps don't have the same fascination. We did one a long time ago and it was a really nice gig. And it just doesn't seem to come up. It, it just doesn't seem to happen. And I sort of think, well, I can't really do it all, you know. I, I can't. I could start and try to, but I ran my own space for years, so I don't really want to have to put it all together, maybe. Yeah, so, um, but I think it'll happen. <laughs> I hope so anyway. But that's my only thing, and I say it at meetings as I say, listen, you guys, you're really slack. You can't get off your ass and do something. So it's that sort of thing, yeah. Clan Analog definitely has a future if the people in Clan Analog now can encourage the people who are coming up to want to be a part of it and to want to commit time to you know, doing things inside it. Hopefully we can get a bit more of a following in Europe or overseas anywhere if, um, if it gets, you know, I mean if it's available there and people hear about it then yeah, hopefully that will, there will be opportunities there. We'd like to get away from, you know, thinking you know, in terms of dollars and sales and product and, and uh, you know, continue on our, our way, you know, being artistic about electronic music, you know, and, and remaining cutting edge and, and remaining, you know, uh, healthy at the same time. get from Clan is a kind of beautiful weathered cynicism about the music industry so that you know being a young thing that you know your eyes are pretty much open before you got involved into any of the sort of the larger more commercial events. The yummiest thing about Clan and being a part of Clan is working and dealing and playing with other people that you know have sounds that you like and enjoy things that you know a number of us do. Well, you never leave clan, I don't think, because it's, um, I still think of myself as a member of clan analog, although I can't remember the last time I went to a meeting, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy to have been a part of that around, you know, 94, 95, 96. It was cool, it was good. I do still consider it like one of my babies. One of the things about Clan that's, that's always key is whether or not Clan as an organisation is going to survive the test of time, whether or not there will still be diverse, interesting music being produced by its members. Uh, and if that is, if that is the case, and, uh, and I still think it is, I think there's still great music being produced by Clan, then it's still got its, its place.
way.